This is Brew City Lounge. Answers back. His first bucket of the fourth quarter. And now with 36 for the game. Yelich sends this one out to center. Bader racing back. He looks up and it is gone. Christian Yelich goes deep. This podcast is for the number one Bucks fans and Brewers fans in the world. And it's part of the Lounge Room Network. Fielder launches. Giannis got the rebound. Good and one. Wow, he's so strong. Here's your host, Brandon Snide. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another jam-packed episode of the Brew City Lounge. I am your host, Brandon. You can go ahead and follow me on Twitter, at Wisco underscore Brandon. Extremely happy to have you guys tuning in, whether you're on the live stream or checking out the show, wherever you get your podcasts. It's an absolute honor to be here to talk our favorite teams, Bucks and the Brewers. Hope everyone out there is doing good. Lots to break down. Huge Bucks game last night I want to dive into, kind of get your thoughts on the end of the overtime with the referees, where the Bucks are headed come playoffs. And most importantly, extremely happy to announce former Brewer and professional baseball player, also a part of Bally Sports Wisconsin, Vinny Rotino, joins me to talk Brewers. You can find him at Vinny Rotino. You can also find him on Bally Sport Wisconsin on the pre- and post-game show. Vinny, thank you for taking the time to join me. How are you doing, sir? Absolutely. No, thanks for having me. Uh, Appreciate the invite anytime. It's it's an absolute honor. Uh, I got a chance to... Meet Vinny down at AmFam Field. I'm, I'm getting so much better with the AmFam Field. It always used to come out Miller Park. So I'm getting – I just got to give myself a little credit there. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, you should. Uh, got a chance should. To, <laughs> got a chance to chit-chat with Vinny down at uh, AmFam Field. If, if you get a chance, stop by. I'm sure he'd love to see you and say hi. He's on the uh, pre- and post-game um, show on Bally Sports. Vinny, I'm going to ask you right off the bat. First off, thank you so much for coming on. Second off, yeah. what – surprises do you have thus far for the Brewers is there anything that kind of sticks out right away when you watch this team and, and they had a really good game last night a 3-1 victory out in out in San Diego uh down on their I guess you could call their B or C squad half their team's out is there any yeah. surprise is there any surprises so far this season for you there is and you know what it's going to be something that's kind of unexpected probably for everybody so the surprise for me is, it's kind of not a surprise, right? So we knew the starting pitching would, would be good. I don't think we knew it would be this good, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, <clears throat> you got, you know, I think we we're all just wondering whether or not Corbin Burns was going to repeat what he did last year. And then he, and he has so far. I mean, obviously tonight he's facing a little bit of a better lineup than maybe the Cubs were when, he, when they were swinging the bats. Um poorly last series but um yeah I I I I don't know I I think this that is a surprise to me because because they have so many guys out they have not swung the bats great and yet they're two games over 500 they beat a really good Padres team last night um yeah I I just I I can't really see like I don't see that this is to, after watching them now for two and a half weeks, kind of locked into every pitch, I don't see that this is, is, is some sort of anomaly or out of the ordinary for how they're getting it done on the mound. It's not like they're giving up a ton of hard contact. Mm-hmm. It's not like they're doing anything um, different that they can't sustain. I see that this is just kind of who they are. And it's, it's, it's exciting to, to know that this could be um, – at you know with at full strength when all their guys are are back I, i'm just kind of excited to see where where how good this team could get and i and i i'm completely with you because i'm i'm a homer there's a, you know, there's no doubt about it i everybody that tunes into the show or watches on youtube they know who i am and i and i'll i, I don't have any you know reason to hide that i love my team yeah, me too and i you know looking into the year you're going into the year And I broke down, I talked to a couple beat writers out in Chicago, uh, a couple out in St. Louis, and I kind of got a feel for where they were headed. Obviously, uh, St. Louis makes the splash for Nolan Arenado, and the Cubs are kind of, you know, in between a bunch of contracts and a bunch of uh, young talent. And looking around at the division, I looked at it as the Brewers as being the strong team. You know, 
that had the offensive talent. In my opinion, you were going to have a better Yelich. Hopefully he bounces back. Colton Juan hitting at Miller Park. Uh, Lorenzo Cain, a uh, whole year healthy. The depth is obviously there. Uh, the bullpen is is arguably at the back end, probably the best in the in the major leagues. And then defensively, you got so many more upgrades with you know uh, Colton Wan and, and Jackie Bradley Jr. alone bring Gold Gloves. So I looked at as the Brewers and, and taking the homer out of it. I looked at them as the favorites. Now I know we're only 16, 17 games into the season. How do you think the Brewers look uh, across the division? The division, I like. I really like their chances. Um, I, I kind of agree with that assessment. I don't see. I certainly I don't see the Cubs really contending. I, I don't know why Pakota has them ranked so high. Maybe because their mm-hmm. offense is so formidable, and maybe because some of their arms have performed well. But I don't. Uh, I don't see sustainability from their pitching staff, to, to be quite honest. Um, and some of their bats are. I mean. I, I actually see uh, I, I see their bats kind of coming alive at some point. They're going to rattle off some wins, but I, I don't see I don't see much of a threat from the Cubs. I, I the Cardinals are the team for me that probably are going to end up mm-hmm. you know making a real strong push. I think especially if Nicolas can get healthy, you know Flaherty is a guy that can is going to contend for the Cy Young. I think year in year out. I know he's not off to the best start. I know he had a good start yesterday, but. Um, the Reds are a little bit of a surprise for me. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, I know they have D. Yeah, I know they have DJ there, the pitching coach the Brewers used to have. So that maybe they're kind of starting to trust him and, and seeing what uh, you know, kind of maybe using the analytics a little bit more. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't watched one single game from them, um, but their lineup is is, is good, and uh, they have that ballpark that's just a band box. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, maybe the Reds are the team that the, the Brewers are going to have to contend with. I know it's a small sample, and, and the Reds are in first place, but um, I, I, I see the Brewers just, especially coming back to full strength. I, I, I see ninety wins. I see ninety wins, and I see that as kind of the floor. But maybe that's just the homer in me. And, Interesting. Um, yeah, um, just because of that. They're a team that is extremely – so I played on a ton of teams, and, and I, I promised myself I wouldn't be that guy that's the broadcast that brings up everything about himself when he played because it, it doesn't really relate, <laughs> you know. Oh, but you got – I mean, you know more than you know more than the average Joe. I mean, we want to hear it. We want to hear it, yeah, tell us. Sure. Well, the, <laughs> the thing that I was kind of related to was the fact that um, – that I played on a bunch of teams, a lot of it in the minor leagues, and the teams that were really, really good at the end of the year were the teams that had 25 guys, and I know there's a 26-man roster now, but 25 guys that were very, very dedicated to winning, okay? Every single day, and that sounds kind of basic and cliche, but believe me, you, you take that for granted, especially – in baseball, you play every single day, and if there's one or two guys that aren't in it for the team and kind of in it for them, themselves, mm-hmm. believe me, it will wear on a clubhouse. It'll wear on a team. So when you have guys like uh, I played with Lorenzo Kane, I know what he's all about. The guy doesn't want to come out of the lineup with with <laughs> pulled quads because he wants to help the team win that bad. It's not about himself. Same thing with Colton Wong. Same thing. And then to, to the nth degree, Jackie Bradley Jr. I heard he's not, he's like that. Um, Christian Yelich, um, mm-hmm. you have, and then you watch Corbin Burns and um, Brandon Woodruff compete, and how much they. It's not about them, right? I mean, um, it, it's a special. I think this is a special group of people, okay, that really want to win for each other, and and why and we're only two and a half weeks in. You get some momentum of the season where everyone, you know, everyone's kind of playing well together. They're going to gel, get to a point where it's like, okay, we're down three, nothing in the fourth. We know we are going to come back and win. And that's a good feeling. And you get that feeling by having a group of guys like that. So um, that's what I'm excited about with this team. And the fact that um, I don't see that in any other, on any other team in this division. And I don't see, and if there is, I don't see uh, there's another team like that, like let's say the Pirates or something. I don't see as much talent, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if the Pirates are right. like that or not, right. but um, I just don't. I don't see as much. I see the I, I see the Brewers have 
I, I see the Brewers have the market for the division on talent and on that winning piece, the, the intangible piece. So um, I definitely see uh, them winning the division. And I, and I agree with, I agree with everything that you're saying. I mean, every piece that you just named off and it kind of leads into my next question for you is going into spring training. You obviously had Lorenzo Cain missed all of life or most of all last year and all, you know, all of last year, I mean, 60 games and you get, you know, word that, you know, the Brewers are signing Jackie Bradley Jr. And you, you see a lot of Brewers fans and I call it the dark web because that's what Twitter and Facebook are. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're yeah. you know, they know everything. So then you, you get a lot of people saying, you know, why do we need, you know, Jackie Bradley Jr. We need pitching. We need this. And, and, and you look at Tyrone Taylor, then you look at Billy McKinney. And I mean, my goodness, I tip my hat to David Stearns and, and Craig mm-hmm. Council, because when you, you, you got 36 year old Lorenzo Cain and he's going to, he's going to, he's going to get banged up the way he plays. Like you mm-hmm. said, he, go, yeah. he wants to play all the time and he goes a hundred percent every time he's out there, these guys that they picked up and, and you put quotation around guys, because that's what initially you saw Tyrone Taylor, Billy McKinney, just guys. And then Jackie Bradley jr. I mean, David Stearns went out he knew what he was getting with each one of these guys. And he knew that there was going to be a time that Lorenzo Cain might miss a game. Christian Yelich's back will flare up and, and he's plugging guys in. I mean, you you lose Lorenzo Cain and you're not skipping a beat with Jackie Bradley Jr. I mean, yeah. I mean, David Stearns went out and and the depth on this team, and I know Tim Dillard broke it down. And and I, I said describe the Brewers in one word, and he said depth. And I mean, it it, it feels like at every position, obviously they traded Orlando Arcia that you know dips into that infield depth a little bit. But I mean, what are your thoughts on like David Stearns' offseason? Because it, it 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 seems like it was quiet, but then you look at it and you're like, wow, like they just they aren't skipping a beat, no matter who's in there. Yeah, Bill Schroeder before the game uh, yesterday or two days ago, talking about this exact same thing, and specifically he was talking about Jackie Bradley Jr. But he said pretty immediately just said the phrase pretty shrewd move by David Stearns right there. And it's true. <laughs> it is definitely true. I mean, it's shrewd as can be because uh, how smart um, the foresight. Yeah. No, no casual fan or even, even a more dedicated fan really sees the Jackie Bradley signing as like a, like a, a need. I mean, there was a definite hole at third base. Everybody saw, and he, you know, he had the foresight to say, Hey, wait a minute. Travis Shaw is no slouch. Um, let's give him another opportunity. I don't think he, I don't think anybody forced, you know, could foresee that he was going to bounce back to 2017, 2018 type performance, which I do believe is is in there this year because some of the adjustments that he and Andy Haynes made in spring training. But um, yeah, I, I think the depth of the team is, is something that's really, really encouraging that um, and, and, he, and, and that's the other thing because they're a group of winning guys that just want to win everyone just no one was really even like been out of shape about that move right mm-hmm. <laughs> everyone just kind of saw it as okay we got another winning piece here yeah even though there's four outfielders for three spots really three outfielders for two spots is really how you could look at that absolutely going into spring training so um but yeah and, and look at that and two guys are down and now really it's um uh, probably a platoon situation for a little while between Taylor and McKinney and then the other two. And, and, and that's the, and that's the, that's the thing that I don't think people really understand is how much, how much value Jackie Bradley Jr. brings to a team in a number of ways, but, but mainly, I mean, he's going to, he, he'll hit and he'll do some damage and he'll be a valuable offensive player, but on the defensive side of the ball and on the bases, he impacts a game. And then in the clubhouse, he impacts a team. So it's fun to watch him play center field, right? I mean, he's not, he's, I don't even think you could probably grade him as a plus runner from home to first. I think it takes him a little while to get going, but how smooth is he in the jumps and the routes that he gets and the instincts out there um, in his hands. Uh, he's, he's really, really fun to watch out there. And so, so my point in saying that that signing, I think everyone kind of understood like, Lorenzo Cain didn't even play last year. He's 35. He's going to probably miss some time. Last year, the Brewers had to plug in. Didn't they plug in Ben Gamble and oh, yeah. Avisel Garcia in center field? And those, yep. neither of those guys, that's out of position for them. So a fly ball, a flare that, that drops in because of a bad route by one of those two guys. that drops in and now it's first and second instead of with one out instead of 
two outs with a runner on first. People don't understand what that does to the psyche of a pitcher. That's his ERA out there, uh, yeah, right? No kidding. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, I mean, in a bad route, a bad jump on a ball that should get caught is really it really messes with guys, and it really affects how they make pitches, how they execute pitches. There's more stressful pitches with runners in scoring position. On the flip side of that, Jackie Bradley Jr makes an unbelievable play in the gap. And instead of second and third, nobody out because of a double that was just hit. It's now runner on first, um, you know, one out because Jackie Braley Jr. just made an unbelievable play. Mm -hmm. So um, the psycho, the psychological part of that is in Craig council talked about this in press conference, but I've always said this It's it's the impact defense can have on your pitching staff and on your team isn't, it can't really be measured because of those scenarios, right? The, the, the stress that a pitcher has to pitch through traffic or pitch through, you know, situations with runners in scoring position where maybe it shouldn't be that situation, right? If a, if a defensive play had been made the play before. So that's how it's impacting the game. And that's how I think um, we're going to continue to see that this year from, from, from Bradley. And then, Clearly, if Kane's in the lineup too, and when he's healthy, he does the same thing. So, um, yeah, a huge, huge signing. And I mean, you see it, you see it too with a lot of, and you know this again, talking to Vinny Rotino here on the Brew City Lounge, talking about the Brewers and talking about the Boston Red Sox. And, and you talk about those two teams, and there's a huge difference there. You talk about that's obviously where Jackie Bradley Jr. came, and they, you know, Boston had their run of not winning titles for I don't know however long it was, 100 years, whatever it was. And then that winning culture, you know, turned while mm-hmm. Jackie Bradley was there and he won a couple championships. And I love that that aspect of him coming to the team. I absolutely agree with you. You plug him mm-hmm. at center field. He is arguably one of the best defensive center fielders, mm-hmm. maybe defensive players in all of baseball. But what I loved about that signing, along with Lorenzo Kane, you're bringing in a cultural change in Milwaukee, something that we've seen. You were a part of it uh, back in, you know, what, 12, 13 years ago mm-hmm. when, it, when we, when the Brewers got back into the playoffs in 08, but it, you know, we kind of went away with that for a while. And now we're back into, it's the third, you know, three straight years into the playoffs, a winning cultural. When you add in guys like Jackie Bradley jr. Obviously you added Lorenzo Kane a few years ago, but all that does is help that help that locker room. It helps guys like Christian Yelich look at, Jackie Bradley Jr. And I'm not saying that Christian Yelich looks up to Jackie Bradley Jr., but from a leadership aspect, he might. And that's what I like about and that's what I like about Jackie Bradley Jr. coming in, you know, him and Lorenzo Kane kind of taking over, maybe not taking over the locker room. That's, you know, that's maybe Yelich's locker room. But hey, you know, we're, you know, we're in a rough spot in, you know, the end of July. Uh, Jackie, you know, what are some of the things that we can do as a team? And and so bringing him in on the field and off the field is something I really thought was valuable. Yeah, that, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. And look, leaders, there, there's, there's a team full of leaders right there. And, and when you get that, that, that again, that is taken for granted. I don't think, I don't think people really understand what kind of team culture there is. And you, there, I don't see a guy that's again that's in it for himself. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't, I just, I, I played with a lot of these guys. I scouted uh, a lot of these guys. So I had to do my homework on these, on these guys. And I don't see one single guy in that clubhouse. That's uh, the, the guy, you know, that selfish player that's looking out for his contract next year. Um, I see a bunch of guys that just want to win a world series. Now, whether or not they get, you know, whether or not they do it, I don't know. They certainly have the starting pitching to do it. I'll Absolutely. see that. So um, I w- I'm just really excited and kind of I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm, what's the word? I just, I, I'm excited about when this team is full strength, how good they can really be. I think they can rattle off a ton of wins in a row. And when you do that, like, you know, May, June, whatever, that's mm-hmm. when you can kind of build a lead and there's there's a ton of momentum going into the playoffs. So um, that's what I'm excited about. Speaking of starting pitching, and I made this comment both to Dario and Tim on previous shows, and I said, you know, hey, <laughs> if I got to eat crow, I'll have to eat crow. I've done it before. I'll do it again. And I <laughs> said it and I said, you know what? I said, I've been a Brewer fan my whole life. I've, you know, the heydays of Ben Sheets, you, you, you know, you've, you've been on some really good Brewers teams and, and so you've seen it as well. 
And I told him, I said, I know we're only a couple games into the season, but Corbin Burns looking like he was again during the COVID year, the 60 games uh, season last year, seeing what I'm seeing out of him so far, looking at Brandon Woodruff as consistent as he always is. And then you got Freddie Peralta, who seems to be not so much Freddie fastball anymore as he has uh, strikeout Freddie. And then you look at Adrian Hauser and then I'm like, okay, if Brett Anderson is your fifth starter, you yeah. know, I de- I mean, to me, and it's super early and again, I'll, I'll eat it if I have to, but this is the best brewer starting rotation that I can remember. And I don't mean, I'm much young. I mean, I'm younger than you, but I mean, to me, this is the best starting rotation that I can remember. Yeah. So you're, you're out on the Jeff D'Amico rotation. <laughs> with um, I can't even name it. I can't even name it. Uh, I like Kyle not... Loesch and I no disrespect yeah. to any of them. I mean, there's no disrespect to them, but yeah, this, I mean, and, and these are homegrown guys, you know, that's the best part about it. We didn't go out and pay, Brandon Woodruff, well, we didn't pay him yet, but, you know, we didn't go out in free agency and give him, you know, 150 million. Like these guys, we, you know, drafted and, 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 and grew in, in, into the farm system and, and now they're flourishing in the majors. And I don't know. I mean, it's way too early, but it just feels like it's a dominant era for the Brewers as far as starting pitching goes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I haven't, I can't recall a starting staff besides maybe the Dodgers right now right. <laughs> that that could be better. Um, but who knows? I mean, if, if Freddie continues to develop and Adrian Hauser, Adrian Hauser is an interesting one. He's the wild card in mm-hmm. this for me. I think you're going to get what you're going to get from Brandon Woodruff. I think he's going to, I think you know exactly who he is. I don't know. how. I don't think we know how good, um, Corbin Burns actually is. I am. Right? So, I, I am. I have a, a huge, disclaimer right now i have a huge man crush on him i just love i i am just yeah. he is just something else man i oh goodness he's he's so good fun to watch um he continues to improve the dominance of the stuff look at the end of the day brandon woodruff's slider isn't that it, it, if you were going to grade that slider in a vacuum you would just kind of maybe put an average grade on it it doesn't mm-hmm. have that sharp late tight bite that would when you watch Brandon Woodruff slider compared to Mus- Joe Musgrove slider last night, yeah, you can see a, di- a discrepancy in terms of the bite to it, right? They, he doesn't get a ton of swing and miss and chase out of the zone with it. But his fastball is so good. And the fact that he has t- so much um, – he, ha- he, has he has really good, really, really good instincts to pitch and feel to pitch and feel for the ball. And, and, his, and his fastball is so, so powerful – that his slider does end up becoming effective in, in within that bats right um but the counter is true for for burns he has a wipeout slider um he just has that ability to spin the baseball um now he's learning all, all of a sudden he's learning a change up he's got that cutter and two seamer working where he can now make a crisscross on the plate um at 97 miles an hour good luck right um <laughs> no kidding and he's learning how to command it so I think Woodruff is is a top of the rotation guy, worth a lot of money, right? On the on the free agent market someday. That that's a that's the type of guy he is. I think he's he's shown that he's consistent. That start last night was probably had to be the best performance I've seen from him. Why? Because he 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 had thirty pitches out of, in the first inning, <laughs> and, and 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 Jerks and Profar had no shot to to do any kind of damage against him. And he had a great at bat. He fouled off ten. You know, he had a ten pitch at bat, and he walked them. Turned into a thirty pitch inning after losing the series to the Pirates. Musgrove just wiped out the first three batters in the Brewers order. There had to be a ton of momentum on the other side of the on the other side of the field in, in the Padres dugout. Had to be. I guarantee you, the Brewer dugout, the Brewers dugout, was probably feeling like, uh oh. Uh, yeah. we're going to be back to 500 <laughs> after tonight. Right. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. and it all started with jerks and Profar's first at bat, 10 pitch at bat where he had no chance to get a hit. Um, just, just had a good at bat and missed that last three, two pitch, but turned into a 30 pitch. Inning. He comes back and throws six clean innings and gives the Brewers a chance to hit a couple of mistakes by Musgrove out of the ballpark. And now all of a sudden they win that game. That that was, we may be looking back in a month, and re, and I hope this is the case. I know this is the day after that game, but we may be looking back in a month and say, 
that was from the second inning to the seventh of that game, that game one in, in San Diego was the biggest part of the season so far. And I don't think you're wrong about that either, especially with, you know, again, no disrespect to the lineup last night, but you're missing a good portion of your starters, positional players. Yeah. Yeah. So he kept it close for him. A couple of home runs, which, you know, tip your cap to Urias and McKinney hitting Mm -hmm. homers off of Joe Musgrove. That's pretty, I mean, that guy's wipeouts. (laughs) Nasty, nasty stuff. But um, yeah, it was a big win last night. Now, now think about, players win that game and then all of a sudden they're getting you know they're taking their cleats off ready to jump in the showers they get ready for tomorrow and they're thinking to themselves we got burns going tomorrow (laughs) right so now they're feeling pretty good it'll be a big game it'll be a big game tonight um you know having burns go against paddock i've I've always liked paddock but paddock is he's a he's i like him too he's a he's a he's a I, i saw your breakdown on him on twitter if you don't Follow Vinny on Twitter. I highly recommend it at Vinny Rotino. He is the man. He breaks it all down. I got a couple more questions. I'm going to let you go. I have yeah. I, wanna, I have one kind of negative question I want to ask you. Yeah. And then we'll and then we'll get to a fun question. But and I asked this, and and this is just out of a concern. This isn't. I don't think that they're bad. I don't think that they're going to be the downfall on the team or maybe the the the, the straw that breaks the camel back camel's back. The bullpen to me seems a little shaky, and I know. It's early, you know, Suter giving up. I mean, he's got a 3.48 ERA. Rasmussen is up over 11. Yard leads over seven. Even Devin Williams has got, he's over seven um, ERA. And I I don't know. And I know it's early and Williams didn't do much in the spring. So I'm really not too worried about him. I'm worried about that middle inning reliever. We know Craig doesn't really like to let the starters go more than six or seven. Is that a concern to you? Is that something you look at like, man, they just got to, they just got to find it, and once they find it, they're going to be okay. Because I, I have high hopes for Drew Rasmussen. I, I, I love that guy. You know, hard thrower, consistently in the upper nineties. Suter's a fun guy to watch. He change of pace, he irritates batters. I just is it something I'm overthinking, overanalyzing? Because I'm trying to find everything that I possibly can when I watch this team. But when I watch the bullpen, I just don't have the faith outside of Hater right now that they're going to shut it down and get it to the end of the game no I, I i i'm with you in terms of your concerns um that's the one kind of question mark i think uh that's on the team there there's no bridge be- right now there's not a real bridge between starting pitching the great starting pitching that they've been getting to josh Hader, and in the fact that devin williams is not devin williams of 2020 um I think everyone kind of had the idea that there would be some sort of adjustment, right? The fact that he was hurt and he had to, he hadn't really thrown much in spring training. I think everyone kind of was like a little bit leery of where he, he would be. I think, I think he's going to be fine. Okay. Um, I think Devin Williams would be fine. He just, personally, I don't think he looks like himself right now. The, he does The concern. Yeah. The concern comes in for me when I watch him yank, uh, fastball after fastball to the uh, left-handed mm-hmm. batters, left-handed hitters batters box, and mm-hmm. then also doing the same thing on changeup. So that means he's not really staying in his delivery. He's really pulling off, um, <clears throat> trying to add a little bit. So he's just out of sync. He's just not himself yet. And then that kind of that'll snowball on you, especially you get off to a slow start, and all of a sudden you think you have to put up zeros your next seven outings in a row. That clearly doesn't work, right? To think that way, so. I don't know if he's thinking that way. I just, I just know that if he gets that that changeup right, if he gets that that feel for it of getting through that thing, um, I think he'll be. And it was almost like the fact that Sogard hit it right in in Wrigley that one mm-hmm. game where he hit that triple. It was almost like that's the one that kind of like because he was throwing some nasty ones in, in spring. So I'm just wondering, like, if that created a little bit of doubt in his mind right through release as he's, you know, getting through the ball right there on his changeup. I don't know. He'll he'll find it again. But until then, I think Brad Boxberger is going to have to kind of be that mm-hmm. guy in the eighth inning, which that guy's actually pretty encouraging. When I saw yeah, him, he's when been I, great. He's been great. 
Yeah, I saw him scouting in 2019. He was 88 to 90. I was like, this guy needs to go pitch in AAA. <laughs> and, and I mean, it was like he was getting tattooed everywhere, all over the ballpark. And it was straight as a string. There was no deception. But now it's like 94, 96. Where is this coming from? With a good hard slider that's kind of like a 12 6, 12 6 little short slider, decent changeup. He's got a cutter in there. Like, it's a real bullpen guy um, all of a sudden. And um, he's got that deceptive carry on the fastball through the zone, through the top of the zone. So I think that was just one mistake, honestly, for, that he, he – Brian Reynolds is a good hitter, and he, and he got yes. he got on top of it, got through, and that ball was where Prince Fielder used to hit balls that he <laughs> hit the other day, um, second deck there. Um, but – so I think he's I think he's actually pretty encouraging. If you can if you can get Angel Perdomo to throw strikes with his fastball to set up that slider, I think he's going to be a, a piece that the Brewers could use. Fire Eyes has been a huge uh, addition. I, I just think he's probably like a year away of, mm-hmm. from being like an eighth inning guy or something. Or the oppor- I mean, he'll get the opportunity to be like seventh eighth inning guy in leverage situations. We saw last night and he was fine. So he'll I think he, there's just going to be some you know, learning curve along the way, but I love the stuff that I see out of him. Um, yeah, I mean, but I agree with you a little bit in terms of like, it's not like, it's not like the Rays bullpen or anything, right. With like four guys that are just wipe out, you know, just no one's going to touch them. They're just going to punch everybody out. I will say this Stearns coming into almost every year Stearns seems to, it's kind of seems to be the conversation. Oh, we just have Josh Hader back there, but all of a sudden like guys kind of emerge. Right. Mm-hmm. I know. I, I know the Brewers had Knable and Burns uh, for a couple of years there, but um, I'm sorry, not Burns, Knable and Hader. Um, well, Burns came out. He did. You're, no, you're right though. In the 2018 playoffs, he was coming out of the bullpen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I meant Hader, but yeah. So it's a little bit of a concern for me, but Maybe some guys will emerge. The, the, I guess the the only caveat to that is maybe they won't. Is that the, the fact that they're young? That they're, there's not a ton of experience down there besides Boxberger. So that is a little bit of a just kind of raises your eyebrows a little bit. But guys get thrown in there and they'll 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 get the job done for the most part, probably. But there, I'm I'm with you, Bill. So, so speaking of. JP Fires and he's a Wisconsin guy. He's also from yeah. River Falls. I gotta ask you, and 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 I know I kept you over the time that I told no you time. I was gonna keep you, and I appreciate no, it. No, I enjoy it. <laughs> um, so you're from born and raised in Racine, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I gotta ask you. I mean, growing up, obviously your team was the Brewers, right? Had yeah. to have been, yeah. right? Okay. Oh yeah. So that's a dream come true, I, I would assume. So what, like, what's your favorite Brewers memory that you can think of? Is it just getting that uniform on? Is it you know, playing at, at, you know, then Miller park. I mean, it, there's gotta be some kind of awesome feeling that I can't even put into words right now because I have no idea what it would feel like to, to play for your hometown team. So like kind of elaborate a little bit on that I'm playing for your favorite team. What's your favorite kind of memory, maybe something that sticks out, uh, in, out in your head a little bit. Yeah. So good question. Um, it's, it's far and away when I, when I got my first at bat is, is kind of the memory that I'll never I'll never forget. It just jumps out at me when someone asks me this question. I mean, this is, I did get the, uh, a walk-off game winning hit to secure a winning season for the Brewers in 2007, but even that, and that was super cool. That was a really cool memory. The team comes out, you know, rips mm-hmm. my jersey off, stuff like that. <laughs> but, but to get called up for my hometown team after being non-drafted, a kid that went to UW lacrosse division three baseball, grinded scraped claw whatever i had to do um to get a chance to, to even just put on a uniform a professional baseball uniform and um and then and then become minor league player of the year in 2004 uh after a really good season with the beloit snappers and then get called up in 2006 september it, I, I and getting that first at bat the reason but so that's all like all that the whole story like it's really cool. And, and I'm really proud of it really. And, the, but the, the memory that really, really stands <laughs> out is the at bat. The at bat was like runner on first base with that entire backstory as a reference point, right? Think about that. 
Okay. Runner on first base, two outs, bottom of the ninth. Ned Yo says you're going to hit if if Jeff Cirillo gets on base. So, so there's no one on base, and there's two outs actually. Jeff Cirillo gets a base hit. I'm like, I'm going to get this done. <laughs> That's what I was thinking to myself. And then all of a sudden, they I actually announced my name. Now batting number, I was actually number eight before Braun. Number eight, Vinny Rotino, and then forty-five thousand fans sell out crowd. Brewers are still in in it for, for the playoffs at the beginning of September. It started just like getting on the it was a standing over like everyone was oh, on their man feet. I can't even imagine. I I couldn't I'm telling you I had to remind myself how to walk to the plate like <laughs> left, right, left, front. Oh, I can only I was imagine fall on my face. <laughs> and it's like just don't fall is kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> But anyway, I, I still as much as much uh, adrenaline was pumping through my veins at that time, and how nervous I was. I still thought I was going to get it done. I was swinging a hot bat in AAA, ended up punching out, took a call third strike that was just off the plate, uh, way too close to take. But um, as, <laughs> as as unfortunate as how that ended up, I still wouldn't trade it for any. It was so such a cool memory and cool experience. So that was it. That's that's absolutely awesome. And I know I can only imagine I get goosebumps walking into the crowd, even in a big game. And even on Saturday when there was only 11,000 or whatever, yeah. there, just I can only imagine from your point of view, Vinny, I appreciate you know the time. It's been phenomenal for you to take the time out of your busy schedule to talk to to me. I, I greatly appreciate it. Guys, I promise you go on Twitter, follow him at Vinny Rotino. He will give you all the inside info that you need. I read his scouting report on Chris Paddock this morning, this morning or this afternoon. Um, so I got a bunch of stuff to look forward to watching that game tonight. If you, if you see him at, at AmFam, maybe he wants me to tell you this. Maybe he doesn't say hi to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Come on down. No, seriously. Heckle me. <laughs> <laughs> just don't just don't heckle him like Tim likes to heckle him. Um. <laughs> that was so great. That was, oh, Tim Dillard. Appreciate the, the shout out, Brandon. <laughs> uh, and, and please follow me, but also follow D- at Dim Tillard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. He's a he's a character, that's for sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Vinny, Vinny, I appreciate it. I hope maybe in the near future I can get you back on. We can break some more awesome Brewer stuff down, and and, and hope to see you at the at the ballpark again. And and thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. No, anytime. Um, yeah, and um, look forward to coming back on. Awesome. Thanks, ha- have a good night, sir. You too. Bye-bye. That's Vinny Rotino, ladies and gentlemen. That was absolutely awesome. He takes you into an in-depth look into exactly what he sees. Again, that he used to play the game. He was a professional baseball player. He was on that 2008 uh, Brewers run when they the CC Sabathia, Prince Fielder. He was on that team, and it was really awesome to get to talk to him. And, and, and a lot of things I kind of agree with him. This is a 90-win Brewers team. This is the best starting pitching that we've probably ever seen. This is the – the highest ceiling right now that I can remember for a Brewers team in really quite some time. You look back at that 2018 team, there was a lot of unknowns. There, we didn't know Yelich was going to be an MVP. We didn't know how Lorenzo Cain was going to pan out. We, we knew of him, but we know these guys now. We know Jackie Bradley Jr. is a gold glove winner. Colt Wan hits 280 career, a gold glove winner. Now you're looking at the bullpen putting together a, a big run, a big stretch of, of games here where absolutely dominating. I mean, if you tuned in last night, the Brewers win big one, big game, in my opinion, the first game out West, always a tough one. The time change, the atmosphere, the weather, and they win three, one couple solo shots, uh, Urias, Tyrone Taylor. Um, I believe there was one more. I can't think about top of my head, but, Brewers win 3-1, big win last night. Um, so it was awesome to get Vinny Rotino's perspective on the on the Brewers season thus far. Again, it's really early. But, hey, setting the, you're setting the tone in the division. These, you, you beat the Cubs, you beat the Cardinals, then you beat the Cubs again. And for whatever reason, I don't understand why, but continue to struggle against the Pittsburgh Pirates. He dropped two out of three, but that's okay. Brewers off uh, on, uh, actually in about a half hour, first pitch out in San Diego. Um, so we're going to kind of transition over to the Bucks, But first off, from our sponsors at One Call Tech, guys, if you're paying too much for your cable bill, I highly recommend you head over to One Call's website, www.onecalltech.com, or give them a call at 
five zero and tell them Brandon from the Brew City Lounge sent you. I promise you, they have like a hundred years of experience, small business. They will take care of you. They are absolutely awesome people. Adam and the guys over there, they do wonderful work. So we're going to transition over to the Milwaukee Bucks. And if I haven't said it on Twitter, again, follow me on Twitter at Wisco underscore Brandon. You can follow the podcast page at Brew City Pod. Also jump on Facebook, hit us up over there. That Bucks game last night. Oh, man. That Bucks game last night. I had to go and try to get a new phone today and I'm not it's not one of my proudest moments but I'm just being honest I I get so invested in these games I get so animated and and I understand that it's a regular season game I understand that we're a month away from the playoffs I understand that a win or loss here or there is not going to make or break the season but last night really bothered me really bothered me because of not because they lost I mean, eventually, I mean, obviously, yeah, I wanted them to win, but it part more so that the NBA has a real problem. And I love the NBA and I'm a diehard Bucks fans. And those of you that know me or follow me on Twitter, you guys know that I love the Milwaukee Bucks. I absolutely love Giannis. He's probably my favorite athlete to ever, that I've ever watched or I've ever cheered for. But that Bucks game last night was very frustrating. And again, playing a really good Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Suns team on at home, at the Pfizer, you got a seven point lead in the fourth quarter. I think there was three minutes left, maybe a little bit more. And you couldn't buy a bucket. I know at the three fifteen mark. And I specifically know that time because I wrote it down. Marcus Johnson makes a comment, buck struggling to get a bucket, buck struggling to get a bucket. And then the Suns go right down. They get an easy lay in a floater into the paint. And then, a, and then a corner three. And, and I don't know how many more, I don't know about you guys, I don't know how many more corner threes I can watch go down before I go to the Pfizer forum and play defense and just sit in the corner. I don't understand the offense. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand the defensive philosophy of Mike Budenholzer. I just don't get it. They just seem to not be able to close games out. And we're going to get to that foul call. I'm going to, that's a whole nother segment, but I want to break down just this Bucks team from what I saw last night and, and kind of going forward. And hopefully Giannis's cramps are okay. I I believe it was reported by Eric name of the athletic that it was just cramps and it was nothing too serious. But when you're you're up by seven at home, now I know it's not a sellout crowd on a Saturday night. You got about 2000 fans there. So you're up seven at home. You have the best player arguably in the NBA a really good point guard and and whatever you guys want to say about Chris Middleton, he's still a really good player. I I know everybody wants Bradley Beal and Damian Lillard, but that's not going to happen. And I love, I love Chris Middleton. We'll get to that Chris Middleton as well, but this team seems to struggle offensively late in games. And what I mean by that is not just missing shots. Obviously they're, they struggled last night at making shots. They seem to struggle at the offensive sets that they're running, whatever it is they're running. Why is Giannis bringing up the ball? Why is Chris Middleton bringing up the ball? Why, honestly, why is Dante DiVincenzo bringing up the ball? You just gave Drew Holiday $160 million. Now, maybe, I don't know, maybe the backstory, maybe Drew Holiday doesn't want to bring the ball up. I don't know. But when I'm watching that game and I'm seeing these guys, you know, Giannis at the end of the game, I think it was the end of regulation sitting with the ball at the top of the key and just dribbling it, dribbling it. What are we doing? You know what they're going to do. That defender is going to drop back and somebody's sliding over and they're going to, they're going to cause a wall and it's going to cause a contested shot. Maybe you get to the line and we know as Bucks fans, Giannis doesn't get to the line the amount of times that he should. We know that. I don't understand at the end of games, why the offense becomes so stale. I mean, if Chris Middleton is not bailing people out with hitting shots, by the way, last night for the Chris Middleton haters, Suns 114, Bucks 113, 44 seconds left, Chris Middleton hits a three. Goes to overtime, Suns 124, Bucks 122, Chris Middleton 
hits a three. Fast forward, 22 seconds left. Suns 127, Bucks are down 124, down three points. Chris Middleton hits a three. So if he's not bailing them out at the end of these games, and I believe two of these shots were really highly contested shots. One of them, he was wide open. But it seems like there's a, a lack of you know, offensive gel, fluidity. There's, some, there's a lack of something with the end of these, end of these games. I'm not questioning Mike Budenholzer and, and who, what he runs. He's obviously you know, a professional basketball coach. I'm not going to question. I'm not going to sit here at my, uh, in my basement and tell Mike Budenholzer what he should do or what I think he should do. It just seems from a fan perspective, it just seems like they're missing something. Like there's something at the end of games that are uh, you know, Giannis is bringing up the ball. Or why? Why? Drew Holiday's one of the best point guards in the NBA. You just gave him all that money for a reason. Why is Giannis bringing up the ball? Why is Dante DiVincenzo bringing up the ball? Especially late in games. I want that ball in Drew Holiday's hands. I want Drew Holiday bringing that ball down, initiating the play, and running the freaking play. I mean, am I crazy? Is that a crazy thought? Is that is that crazy? Is that wrong? There's more... There's people out there that have a higher NBA IQ than me, and I could be wrong. But I've watched a lot of NBA, played a lot of basketball. I don't understand what Bud is doing late in games with his offense. And honestly, it's more or less his half-court offense. It's very stale. If Giannis isn't penetrating and kicking or scoring – it just kind of seems to be a very hot and cold offense. And, and it's got to, it's going to have to change. Something's going to have to change. You're, I mean, the playoffs are all half, half court offenses. Everybody knows that. What are you going to do come playoffs? What are you going to do when it's going to come down to three people on Giannis, two people on Giannis? He's double teamed, triple teamed. Uh, set the pick and roll with Drew and Giannis. Drew, I'm Giannis and Chris, like defenses aren't going to stop it on a consistent basis. I don't know why we need to discuss this. This is something that that honestly should be, should be doing every, every game, especially at the late, at the end of games, when you're trying to either draw a foul or get a bucket or even cause some kind of, there was a point where they went two possessions without getting a shot off. I don't know. I just think it's, I think it's unacceptable with the talent on this team, the shot makers on this team, playmakers on this team that we struggle offensively at the end of games. And again, Bucks had a seven-point lead, three and a half minutes left at home. I want to get your guys' thoughts on this Bucks team and where they're going forward. What are your thoughts? Because I can't get a read on them. Drop me a message out on the live feed. Hit me up on Twitter at Wisco underscore Brandon. Hit the Twitter page at Brew City Pod. Also, drop us a like and a follow on Facebook at Brew City Lounge. I just don't know what to make of this Bucks team. I'm just so confused and I want to kind of get your thoughts. You can kind of help me out. Maybe like a group therapy lesson here. Cause I really don't know what to make of them. I don't know who they are. I don't know what their identity is. I know they got a top 10 offense and defense. I think they're like one of only three NBA teams, but there's, there's gotta be something that gives and what's it what's it going to be you're going to get bounced in the first round because you that, that's not a that's not something that's not an impossible thing I mean that, that very well can happen especially if you draw Miami or Boston in the first round and both of those guys both of those teams aren't are right there in that in that in that seating Miami seven Boston's five I mean there's a possibility the Knicks and, and the, the Celtics are are neck and neck right now same record Knicks on the tie or the Celtics on the tiebreaker. Miami Heat are only a game out of that sixth spot. So you could very well have an NBA playoff run if you were to go this far of Miami in the first round, Philly in the second, Brooklyn in the Eastern Conference Finals, and then probably the Lakers. I mean, that's a daunting gauntlet of NBA playoffs. I mean, that is. I don't, you're not going to, it's not going to happen. 
I mean, unless the Bucks go on some ridiculous run, I just can't see them getting through all of those teams. Quite frankly, I can't see them at as of right now getting through two of those. I would not be surprised the, the one bit if you got bounced by Miami, maybe Boston in the first round. I mean, this is, as a Bucks fan, this is what we've always wanted. We've always wanted a superstar. And now we got our own. We didn't go out in free agency and get him. We didn't pull him off of the Lakers or the Knicks or Chicago and, and sign him to a big free agent deal. We drafted this guy out of Greece. This is our own. Giannis is ours. And if you're a Bucks fan, if you're a fan of Milwaukee sports, Giannis is, he's like family that you just don't know, but he's family. And you'll do anything to defend him. This is everything that we've wanted. And I just don't know what to make of this team. And quite frankly, if I can't get a title within since the 2018, 2019 run, the bubble run last year, maybe this, not this year. I mean, when is it going to, when is it going to hit? You're not going to have Giannis for 20 years. I mean, maybe you do. The wear and tear on his body is, is unmatched. Guy goes to war every game. Is this big three enough to compete? Or do you see them say they draw Miami, say they draw these guys? Do you see this Bucks team getting out of the first round, getting out of the second, getting to the Eastern Conference Finals, getting into the Eastern Conference Finals, winning the Eastern Conference Finals, going to the finals and, and, and small market Milwaukee against probably big market LA? I don't know if there's anybody out west with Jamal Murray going down and Donovan Mitchell's banged up that can compete. Um, obviously, the Lakers will probably be healthy come playoff time. I just don't know. I don't know. And it's frustrating as a fan to, 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 to have that reaction. Because you saw, you saw LeBron in the, in, the, in the Eastern Conference Finals for all those years. And you just dominated. You walked to the finals backwards. And then you watch guys like KD, Kyrie, now James Harden, Jimmy Butler. Jason Tatum is a, is a rising star. And you see these guys into the Eastern Conference Finals, and now you're looking at the Bucks like, man, 2018, 2019 is really going to hurt five, 10 years from now. That was your chance. Not saying that they don't have a chance now. And I know there's a lot of national writers who are high on the Bucks, who say the East is wide open. I don't know. Is the Bucks big three good enough to compete with Brooklyn? With Philly, say what you want about Philly. Joel Embiid's averaging almost 30. Ben Simmons is at 15. And Tobias Harris is at 25 a game. Not to mention, they're coached up by Doc Rivers. We know he blows leads and, and he's not particularly stellar in the playoffs, but he's a damn good coach. So are you worried about Philly? Being, being able to put our big three against their big three. I don't need to talk about Brooklyn. I think we all kind of know whose big three is better. But as a Bucks fan, it's, it's troubling. It's troubling. You got Giannis, who's averaging 28.5 points a game. He's averaging 11 rebounds. You got Drew Holiday at 17.4 points per, per game. Got five and a half assists per game. And Chris Middleton is right there, 20, over 20 points a game. Six rebounds a game, five assists a game. I mean, these are good numbers, all three of these guys. This is probably the best team that the Bucs have put around Giannis 
in quite some time. But is that's what's frustrating. Is this enough to compete with the likes of Brooklyn, maybe Philly, maybe even Miami? Hell, you could even argue Boston right now. They're on a run. I don't know if they won last night, but I'm pretty sure they're at seven, eight wins in a row. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, they are on an absolute tear. And the Bucs are going to have to go through. I'm sorry, they lost. Boston lost yesterday. Okay, so they, they're seven and one in their last eight. So they're hitting the right time. They're hitting fire at the right time. Miami's catching a little bit of fire. They won last night big. I know they played Houston, but they won big. So what's what's your guys' thoughts on the Bucks? I mean, I mean, are you as confused as I am about this team? Because I'm just really unsure. You, you turn on a game one day and, and they win by 50. Yeah, out on the road against Portland. And then there's times where you turn on the game and the whole team's sitting out. Or like last night. And I know and absolutely all the credit to Phoenix. That a team is really good. They're fun to watch. I have all the respect in the world for Phoenix. But like, where does this Bucks team sit with everybody? Did they even beat Phoenix? Is I guess quote unquote big three: Chris Paul, Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton. What Chris Middleton are we going to get? Is Giannis going to be healthy? This team seems to have a lot more questions around their big three than it does on the other teams that I've mentioned before. And again, if you're just joining the podcast or you're just tuning in. I'm comparing the Bucks' big three to the rest of the league and the competing teams, Brooklyn, Philly, Miami, Boston, LA. Is this Bucks' big three on the level of those? And a lot of you guys will probably sit there and be like, well, wow, of course they are. Are they? On paper, yes. Giannis is a two-time MVP and the defensive player of the year. Yes, on paper, they should be. What Chris Middleton are we getting? Are we getting a healthy Giannis? We haven't seen Drew Holiday on this team in the playoffs yet. We, we know what, what, he, what we can expect from him. We know who, what kind of player he is. But when it comes down to the playoff, basketball is totally different. And anybody that was a fan of the NBA, anybody that's watched the NBA for more than a day knows that. It's a different type of game. It slows down. It's more physical. So it begs to ask the question. And again, hit us up on Twitter at Bruce City Pod. Hit me up on Twitter at Wisco underscore Brandon. I really want to know what your guys' thoughts are with this Bucks team, because I'm confused. And I was really mad last night. And I'm going to get into why I was really mad in just a second. And we're going to end on that note, because then I'll get re-mad, and then I'll ruin my night again. And we got a comment dropping in. Brother-in-law, Sean, says, we don't have enough to beat the Nets. And at this point, it's hard to argue with him. It's hard to really argue with what his statement is saying because KD Kyrie and James Harden, although they're nuts, KD's probably the most thin, thin skinned pro athlete I've ever seen. Kyrie Irving is absolutely, you never know what to expect. And James Harden is James Harden, but he's the MVP. And obviously KD's the MVP and a finals MVP and a fine and a champion. And so is Kyrie. So he's right. Like they don't have enough right now that we have seen to beat the likes of Brooklyn. Now, again, playoff basketball is different. What we're seeing now with this Bucks team, they might just be pedaling in the water and just waiting for the playoffs. And if they're set with the three seed, then they're set with the three seed. But it's a good question to ask because it's a, it's a question that we're eventually going to get the answer to. We're eventually going to see these guys go up against Miami or, or uh, Boston, uh, maybe the Knicks. 
But that second round, you're going to get Philly or Brooklyn. And you get past there, you're getting the Eastern Conference Finals, and you're getting Brooklyn or Philly. And then if you, by God, get to through the Eastern Conference Finals, well, then you have a date with LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And then that's a whole nother argument. But I want to get to last night. Um, we're going to end on, a, on an angry note, I guess, tonight. Because I'm watching this game last night. <laughs> Rest in peace to my iPhone. And back and forth. I, one of the best basketball games I've watched in, in a very long time. All the stars played. Nobody was resting. Nobody was hurt. Quote, unquote, hurt. I mean, there's two teams going back and forth. Chris Paul coming down, boom, nails a 15-footer. Drew Holiday coming back down the other side, backing him in, nails a, a, a floater. I mean, back and forth, back and forth. I mean, they were just swinging for each other at the end of that game. And then Bucks had a chance at the end of the game to win the game. Giannis has the ball. He slips at pretty much the end of it. There was, I think, like a couple seconds left, but it didn't matter. They didn't get off a really good-looking shot. Devin Booker had a chance to win it as well. He misses it. So two good teams. I mean, the, the Phoenix is number two seed, I believe, out West, and you got the Bucks as a three seed. I mean, two really good teams at a, at a marquee matchup, at a marquee time, going at it, absolutely going at it. Two really good coaches, superstars all over on both sides, absolutely phenomenal game. And then you get to the overtime. Again, back and forth. Bucks get down by six. Pat Connaughton. Nails a three. P.J. Tucker nails a three. Bucks tie it up. And he, I mean, keep in mind, these guys are going at it. There was a, a play that I vividly remember. Dante v- DiVincenzo gets pushed down in the paint, and there's no call. Okay, that's fine. We're going to play like that. Let's play like that. That's absolutely fine with me. And then you got Devin Booker, 20 seconds left on the clock. Drew Holiday has literally put his clamps on him, shut him down going into these final seconds, just shut him down. And then you bail him out, Devin Booker, that is, with a call like that. And I'm not just speaking as a Bucs fan. I'm speaking as a fan of the game, as a fan of the NBA. Why? Why are we letting referees dictate who comes out and wins these games why i mean imani williams was quoted after the game he heard a quote-unquote slap no you didn't imani williams i have a lot of respect for you you didn't hear nobody get slapped he grazed his elbow and and enough to first off devin booker didn't even get the shot off in time so that's number one shot. Even if he doesn't graze his elbow, Devin Booker's shot doesn't count. It doesn't even matter. But you call a foul of 0.3 seconds on the clock because of what? This is, this is basketball. Like, this is where the NBA has a problem. And they got a few other problems. Do not let referees at the end of the game, especially with two really good teams, the number two seed out west and the number three seed in the east, going at it back and forth, back and forth, overtime looking like it's going into double overtime and then call a phantom follow because you just think that there was a follow there because why? Because that's what, that's where the NBA is going. That's why there's always a follow on some play and you can point the finger at who, you know, who to blame. I know who to blame. But we won't get into that. But the NBA has a serious problem, and, it, and it's a problem throughout, for the most part, professional sports. But the NBA has gotten really bad. I mean, the NBA has got bad that they had to put in a, an anti-flopping rule. They have fine players for flopping during a game. I mean, that's when you know that the NBA has an issue. And, the, you know, what's the incentive with these ref, referees? They get graded. I mean, thanks to Mark Cuban, these guys are graded on a scale throughout the whole year and it dictates pay raises and it dictates, in the, you know, being a referee in the, in the playoffs and in the finals. And I don't wish, I don't know who made the call last night. I don't wish harm. I don't wish that they lose their job or that they 
don't get promoted or, or any of that stuff. But you cannot let a game like that be decided with a, with a call that wasn't even, I mean, it wasn't even a, a blatant foul. You had to slow the camera down to the slowest speed you could possibly get to, zoom in to the, far, the, the closest angle that you could get to to see that he may or may not have grazed his elbow. With two teams fighting for seeding, two teams fighting for position in the playoffs, you let a foul, you let a call because it was a jump shooter, you, you let that dictate the end of the game. And that's wrong. You're, you're robbing the fans. You're robbing the game. You're robbing the players. And it's not a fun product to watch. And the NBA has got to watch itself. They are on a collision course going forward. Because it's getting ridiculous. And it's not the only game that's been ruined by finals. And if you popped on Twitter yesterday, you saw every major beat writer, Mark, you know, Mark Spears, you know, uh, Shams, Legion Hoops, Hoop Central, all these people tweeting out like, man, best game of the NBA, and it was ruined by a, by a, by a foul call at the end. And you just don't want to see it. And I'm, not, I'm a Bucks fan, and I, I was mad. And my, my iPhone caught the worst of it. But it's a problem league-wide. We don't want these games. If I was a Phoenix Suns fan or say I was a Bucks fan and the calls were the other way around, I would be upset. I want to beat you guys the right way. I want to play the right way. I want to win the right way. But that's my therapy with that because I needed, I needed to talk about that today. And I'm glad I waited till the end of the show to talk about it because now it's out of my system. I can breathe a little bit. I can get ready to watch these brewers. First pitch in about 10 minutes. Bucks are off until Thursday, I believe. And that's another big series coming i shouldn't say series but it's a it's a it's a home and home against philly so they play thursday at, uh, at the pfizer against philly and then also saturday against philly so you have an opportunity to really grab a hold of either that second seed or, or take a spot in you know take a chip away at that number one seed the bucks are four games out of the number one seed and they're three out of the second out of the second seed so there's a lot of seating a lot of games to be decided yet we're going to be here i'm going to be here on the Bruce City Lounge, breaking it all down, you know, with you. I'm going to be sh- mad with you. We're going to celebrate together. We're going to be angry together. We're going to do it together. I appreciate your support. I appreciate the, the, the on social media. If you see me walking around, thank you. Appreciate you guys uh, giving me an opportunity to, to break down the Bucks and the Brewers. We'll, uh, we'll hopefully celebrate one day together. Um, if you're not on the live stream, that's okay. Do not forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon. There's like seven others. I don't know. Wherever you get your podcast, you can go ahead and download all the shows, subscribe, follow, leave a review. Please let me know what you would like to see in the show, what maybe you want me to talk about a little bit more. I will take all the reviews in and I will read through them and I greatly appreciate the feedback. Um, if you're on social media, I highly recommend you following us on Twitter at Brew City Pod or on Facebook uh, at Brew City Lounge. I am your host, Brandon. Follow me on Twitter at Wisco underscore Brandon. I will see you guys again on Friday. I don't know who the guest is yet. I'm still working a few uh, things out, so stay tuned for that. Shout out to Vinny Rotino for joining the show. That was awesome. Uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. And let's go Brewers about 10 minutes first pitch and we'll see you on friday and we'll break down the bucks in the uh, 76ers have a great night god bless you guys stay safe and talk to you soon later hey guys as always thank you so much for tuning into the Bruce city lounge if you need to catch up all your bucks and brewers please tune into our social media pages follow us on twitter and Facebook at Brew City Pod. Also, don't forget, subscribe and download wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Google, and more. Thanks so much.